The interpretation of structures on the scale of cross sections is commonly rather under constrained. The interpreter has to make a series of choices as to how they think structures that they observe at the Earth's surface may project into the subsurface. So if we have a fold structure like this, which is on the outer part of the French Alps, the question we need to ask is, how deep does this structure go? And how do the choices we make for this local structure impact on our understanding of the regional tectonics? So that fold structure that we just looked at is this one here. And it comes from a regional cross-section drawn through the outer parts of the Northwest Alps. And it's a good example of a style of deformation we call thin-skinned. It's thin-skinned thrusting because the deformation is only skin deep. It's restricted to those cover sediments of largely Jurassic and younger rocks. And the underlying basement is effectively undeformed and behaves rather like a rigid tabletop across which our tablecloth, the cover sediments, have been pushed. So this is the thin-skinned thrusting model. And its type location, for many people, is this area here, represented on this cross-section through the foothills of the Canadian Cordillera in Alberta. Although this cross-section is a relatively recent version, the demonstration of this style of tectonics probably goes back to the work of Bert Bally and others in the 1960s and the early acquisition of seismic reflection data through thrust belts. They recognised the basement structure continued beneath the thrust belt and was apparently undeformed, even though the surface structure, as you can see on here, is highly complicated and involves a lot of deformation. So this has become the type location for thin-skinned tectonics. But the concept actually goes further back than that, indeed back to the dawn of many of our ideas of thrust systems, and it continues to underpin understanding of thrust systems that we make uh, through analog models. So here we have Henry Cattle back in the 1880s with his deformation rig, and he set it up so that his material was deforming above a detachment, and the lower part of his deformation rig, of course, was undeformed. He made some pretty spectacular models like this, detaching his uh, clay and sand material from a rigid block underneath. So this um, experimental setup has established the thin-skinned tectonic concept and it has been reinforced in our consciousness through repeated analog experiments. So nowadays, thrust belts are often conceptualized as critical wedges. That is, that their shape is in a dynamic equilibrium between the strength of the basal detachment and the internal strength of the thrust belt itself. And various analog models have been developed to show how these variations in strength in the various materials and basal detachment in the system can control the shape of our thrust belt. But these rely on the assumption that thrust belts uniquely form with basal detachments. In other words, that they're thin-skinned. So the question we need to ask here is, is this thin-skinned model ubiquitous? for thrust belts in general. And that's what we're going to explore here. So we can start off returning to our fold in the outer part of the French Alps and asking what's the subsurface structure. So that we can conceptualize the problem like this where we've got some outcropping fold structure, an antiform seen at the Earth's surface. And we may have additional subsurface control just off the fold structure here which may tell us where the layers we see at outcrop exist in the subsurface, and we can project them along those dashed lines towards the fold structure. We may even know where the top of the basement is that we may have detected through seismic experiments or some other form of geophysics. So our problem then is to interpret the white bit in this cross-section, and a thin-skinned interpretation would look something like this. The fold outcrop forms above a thrust ramp, and that thrust has climbed from a basal detachment along the top of the basement, in other words, the base of the cover sediments there, so that the deformation does not continue to depth beneath the fold structure. It's a thin-skinned interpretation.
and the ramp anticline is the explanation for the fold structure. But it's not a unique way of interpreting the surface geology, the well and the top basement pick. This is an alternative. Now, the top basement was only an approximation and often underneath these fold structures, as we'll see, the actual top of the basement itself may be very poorly imaged, so we know roughly where it exists. So in this interpretation, we've elevated our blue, green and orange rocks by pushing back up a thickened purple material at depth, which was the original fill of a half graben that's been shunted back so that the original floor of the half graben is restored more or less to its original elevation. So that's another way we could draw the cross section. So let's compare our two versions. And they have different implications. The one on the left we looked at is thin-skinned. It's dominated by a thrust detachment that climbs off the basement to create a ramp anticline. Whereas the interpretation on the right is thick-skinned. It involves the basement directly under the structure because it is an inverted half graben. In other words, we have a pre-existing normal fault that's been reactivated under contraction. And they have different implications. They have different implications, first of all, for the stratigraphy. So on the left-hand example, the stratigraphy is relatively simple, doesn't vary across the structure significantly. It's a layer cake stratigraphy. Whereas, of course, on the example on the right, the inversion system, we've deformed a pre-existing half graben so that the half graben fill is significantly thicker than it is away from the fold structure. So a more complicated stratigraphic scenario. The other feature is that the detachment dominated system has significantly higher displacement. There's, there's almost twice as much shortening involved in creating the ramp anticline on the left hand version than there is on the inversion structure to the right. So interpretations that involve inversion or thick skin deformation generally imply significantly lower displacements than the equivalent interpretation involving thin skinned geometries. Well this is a relatively hypothetical example. What we're going to do now is explore the interpretation challenge using some real world examples. And we'll start off looking at a history of interpretations for a thrust belt in the foothills of Papua New Guinea. So a cross section that was drawn in the 1980s shows this sort of geometry, a classical thin skinned type of interpretation where the thrusts that we see at the surface root down onto a low angle basal detachment in this case within the Jurassic strata. As more well and seismic data were acquired across the region, the interpretations evolved to this one in here from the early 1990s showing basement in grey involved beneath again a thin skin thrust system. So this is if you like a mixed mode of basement thrusting at depth climbing up into and feeding displacement into a low angle thrust belt above. Contrast these two now with an interpretation drawn a few years later in the mid-1990s like this. And this shows that the thrust structures we see near surface in the blue and green strata, which are Cretaceous and tertiary rocks, root down into fault systems in the grey basement that have controlled lower Jurassic sedimentary basins initially, and these half graben formed in the lower Jurassic have been inverted during the more modern contractional tectonics. It's tempting to assume, therefore, that this development in understanding simply reflects a better set of data that the structural geologists are using to draw their cross sections. So let's have a look at some of the data. It's not quite so clear cut. So this is about as good seismic as you get through this um, fold thrust belt. And it's not great. So we can explore two ways of interpreting the subsurface structure in here. One might look like this. You can see the extent of the seismic coverage shown by the blue strip on there. And in this case, the anticlines are simply interpreted as rooting down onto a basal detachment uh, within those yellow uh, Jurassic rocks. And the basement underneath is uh, weakly deformed, just creating this regional tilt. In contrast, we can interpret the section like this. Again, with the seismic coverage shown by the blue bar above the anticlines. And you can see that the anticlines 
as shown on here as fault bounded and those faults rooting down into inverted half graben at depth. So two distinct interpretations that satisfy the seismic and well data. They have significantly different implications for the deep structure of our thrust belt. The version of subsurface structure you choose has significantly different impacts on the uh, petroleum system within the thrust belt. Well, these different types of interpretation were confronted by Mike Coward in the 1990s. We have basic observations from the surface and from subsurface data. And the question is, what is the structure at depth? And commonly in fault thrust belts, the seismic imaging, as we've just seen, in these critical areas is usually significantly poorer than we'd want. In other words, our interpretation is driven by our model understanding of how thrust belts, quote unquote, should work. So the challenge here is to understand why those blue rocks are elevated so much higher in the thrust belt than they are in their undeformed region out to the right in the foreland. In other words, if we put in the expected elevations of these foreland uh, horizons, in other words, their regionals, how do we uplift the rocks, particularly the blue ones, above their regionals? So interpretation one might look something like this a very thrusty version. It's a thin-skinned interpretation. You'll see at depth that the basement in red is not deformed. It's only those younger rocks that sit on top that have been stacked up. The deeper structure of our thrust belt is a duplex with lots of shortening. The basement is undeformed and the original stratigraphy was rather thin, the fallen thicknesses in other words, and those thicknesses have simply were originally regionally extensive, in other words they formed a layer cake stratigraphy. We can contrast the thin-skinned interpretation, as Mike Coward did, with a thick-skinned interpretation like this, which involves inversion of pre-existing half graben. The normal faults that were originally there have been reactivated as thrusts, consequently the basement is involved beneath the main thrust belt, and you'll see that the stratigraphy is significantly variable across the system. Out on the foreland, it's relatively thin, that's over to the right, but as we go into the pre-existing basin structures, the strata have been thickened up considerably, and then that thick strata is pushed back up on inverted normal faults. So it's the combination of originally thick stratigraphy together with basement-involved inverting normal faults that has jacked up our blue rocks high above their regional. These two models, although based on the same original data, are significantly different. They show different amounts of deformation, in other words, the shortening, different stratigraphies, and therefore different pre-thrust basin geometries. So the choices we make have important implications for a further understanding of the region. And we can really illustrate this now by going to the Italian Apennines, and we're just going to consider interpretations of this area here, the Umbremache area, in the northern Apennines. Back in the 1980s, cross-sections to this region were drawn using the thin-skinned interpretation, and they reached their climax with this cross-section in here, by Roeder and Scandoni, in the early 1990s, which shows the Mesozoic rocks, largely Jurassic in green, stacked up again and again on thrust systems directed out there to the right, towards the east, towards the foreland. And we'll quantify the amount of shortening this cross-section represents by setting up a pin line in the foreland and a reference loose line over there in the thrust belt. And its present distance between those two points is 148 kilometres. So now if we just simply measure around the structure in here, we can work out its restored length. And that green strip restores to a width of somewhere like 330 kilometers. So if we take away the final length, 148, from the original restored width of 330 kilometers, we end up with 180 kilometers shortening through this part of the Apennines based on this interpretation, which relies on a thin-skinned tectonic style. 
But this isn't the only way the surface geology here can be interpreted. Here's a cross section through a very similar part of the thrust belt drawn by Enrico Tappanelli and others some 10 years later. And this one involves basement rocks, those pink rocks, beneath the thrust belt and the largely Jurassic strata represented by those various blues. And if you restore the cross section, this is how the model works. It's an inversion model showing how the surface structures that we see that stack up the Jurassic rocks root down into basement faults that started life as the bounding faults to half graben. It's an inversion model. And the shortening this represents is just 41 kilometers. If we go out to the right to the shore of the Adriatic on the east coast of Italy and a cross section through here with fold structures at outcrop passing down into inverted half graben or graben structures at depth. So a basement involved model and this section here only shows shade of eight kilometers shortening. Well let's now confront the differences between these thin skinned and inversion models. So let's return to the thin skin model with its 180 kilometers shortening. And we'll just consider this area here beneath the Sibyllini Mountains. Notice the elevation of the Jurassic rocks to outcrop in the Sibyllini uh, results from stacking up multiple thrust sheets, in fact, four of them. So it's a four-fold stack of the cover succession in here. Compare this with a version of the cross-section drawn by Shishiani et al. This cross-section has the Sibyllini Mountains lined up in here. In the lower cross section, the Jurassic strata are blue, and you can see they're elevated, but they're not elevated because of lots of repetitions of Jurassic strata, but simply because of inverted Permo Triassic basins at depth. And critically, there's significantly lower contraction in this lower cross section. The top cross section, 180 kilometers shortening. Shishiani's cross section, shows somewhere in the region of 30 kilometers shortening. So the way in which we interpret the subsurface structure gives us radically different estimates of the shortening that the Apennines represent. It also impacts on our understanding of the original stratigraphy. In the thin skin model, the stratigraphy is on a long range, very simple. In the inversion model below, it's got a very complicated internal stratigraphy, particularly of these Permo-Triassic basins. Well, the idea that uh, inversion may be highly applicable to this region is also evident when you look at seismic data in the offshore. And here's a line drawing uh, from the very front regions of the uh, Apennine thrust system on the floor of the Adriatic, where pre mycenaean basin structures have been inverted. And you can see that the fold structure there roots down into a pre-existing normal fault the normal fault being revealed by the change in thickness of those yellow strata, which are Miocene in age. Another reason to be sceptical for the ultra-thin skin interpretations is understanding of the stratigraphy of the Apennines. And here is a cartoon representation of the stratigraphy by Bosslini and others, showing that before thrusting, the region consisted of a really complicated array of sedimentary basins that comprise different fault blocks with fasces and thickness variations underlain by basement faults. And this understanding is based on really detailed stratigraphic work from the various thrust sheets in the region. So in no way does this approximate to a layer cage stratigraphy. So we can perhaps combine some of our understanding from the Apennines here in this sort of cartoon diagram, which shows the idea that quite a lot of the elevation above regional is because of reactivation of basement normal faults. So the fact that the Apennines are there as a mountain belt in terms of its contractional history is because of basement faults that originate in old normal fault systems. However, there could be local detachment in the cover so that you get thrust sheets exposed at the Earth's surface. So what's the role of detachment? You might think with all this complexity on this stratigraphic template that the chance of there being thrust detachments that 
can move one set of strata on top of another is relatively low. But actually, if you look in the middle of the section in here, there are important Triassic evaporites. And as long as these are thick and not radically offset from one another, you can still have uh, low angle thrusting going on, that, which can have thin skin deformation overlying thickening of the crust. So the implication from this is that we need to consider the pre-thrust basin type, its architecture, and the stratigraphic geometries that it contains, while we're making our interpretations of the contractional tectonics. Understanding of both goes hand in hand. If we think our thrust belts as part of a collision origin started off as former rifted margins, then our templates should look something like this, shouldn't they, with pre-existing normal faults and stratigraphic variations. These profiles across the Atlantic show that the different margins have different structure. So in the distant future, when the Atlantic closes and the two margins collide, you might expect to see different structures formed on the North American versus the European side of the system. But of course, not all sedimentary basins have this type of structural complexity. Cretonic basins, which are big sags developed on top of otherwise rather stable continents, show long range stratigraphic continuity. This is a cross section showing the stratigraphic variations across a classic example of a cretonic basin. It's the Witherston Basin in North America. And at first sight, it might look like there's a lot of stratigraphic complexity. But look at the scales. The vertical exaggeration on this is enormous. Let's take off some of this vertical exaggeration. But there's still something like a 100 to 1 vertical exaggeration in this. I've drawn two rectangles, which represent a horizontal distance of 300 kilometers, out of which you could make a very reasonable thin skin thrust system. The stratigraphy in there is remarkably constant. We have to ask yourself, how many thrust belts have formed from former cretonic basins like this? Certainly a good many of them you'd expect to have formed out of either rifted margins or intercontinental rift basins such as represented by this profile through the North Sea. The middle part of the basin in here comprises a whole series of normal fault blocks. So a complicated sin rift system at depth with pre-existing normal faults ready to be reactivated should they get the chance. But a simpler post-rift sedimentary drape across the top and on the flanks. So thin-skinned thrust styles have been applied to the whole crust. Of course, the basement is involved, but the basement in this cross section is involved with detachment from the crust from the mantle along the moho and within the crust. So this cross section drawn by Maurice Matua from the Himalayas in the 1980s, he termed these structures a crustal stacking wedge or a duplex or imbricate system. It's very much based on the idea of thin-skinned tectonics. Here's another example taking those same ideas for the Central Andes, showing the idea, and you can see on the restored template in there, the idea of continuously layered upper and lower crust and mantle. So it's a layer cake stratigraphy, if you like, for the crust and indeed the sedimentary cover on top. And the structural style is essentially a thin skin style. There's no structural inheritance in here. No consideration of what the original basin form might have been. The assumption is there was no original sedimentary basin. It was basically a layer cake st stratigraphic and crustal template. Compare this with this section here through the Pyrenees, which shows that the Pyrenean origin is a restacked rifted margin. And consequently, the restored template takes this into account by showing the crust changing thickness uh, across the region, showing the form of pre-existing sedimentary basins. Now, this is a very early version of this drawn by Francois Roux and others in the, in the very later part of the 1980s more modern understanding would put a lot more detail into the form of the sedimentary basin and therefore understanding how these basins came to be shortened to make the Pyrenean origin representing that top diagram. The section balances, in other words, you can do an audit of crust or cross-sectional area from the final stage section at the top to the lower one underneath.
And doing this type of audit is a really important way of demonstrating the validity. It doesn't mean that the cross-section is necessarily a unique interpretation, but it shows that it can work. So to conclude, thrust belts the world over are very commonly illustrated as thin-skinned, basements assumed to be undeformed beneath the section. So this understanding, based on the Canadian Cordillera, is highly influential. But I would argue that it's been somewhat overplayed. Cross-sections like this, through the northern part of the Apennines, don't take into account the stratigraphic variations within the thrust sheets, and therefore the nature of the original template. Cross-sections like this do they show more complicated behaviours and they show inherited basin structures. So they're taking account of the stratigraphy. This stratigraphic information is critical for understanding structural geometry and therefore the evolution not only of our thrust belt but also of what went before. So in making a choice between thin-skinned and thick-skinned interpretations of a thrust belt, the geologist is dealing with an under-constrained problem. A useful way of tackling the problem is to try out alternatives, but bearing in mind that these alternatives will have different implications for the deformation, the amount of shortening of the stratigraphy involved in the system, and for the pre-thrust basin geometries.